every first of the year, I, uh, I start praying and asking the Lord to give me uh, a sermon, a message for um, AFM. You know, one year was each one reach one. It's, uh, you know, just, but just something that would challenge us. You know, we're at that season of time. We are hearing on the radio on the way here about uh, resolutions. And every year I tell you the same thing that, listen, there is nothing wrong with resolutions. In fact, in fact, I think they're great. And the reason I think they're great is because it's you taking stock of your life. And I don't care what the resolution, read the Bible more, lose weight, quit smoking, this, that, the other. Resolutions are you looking yourself in the proverbial mirror and saying, what do I need to do differently than I did last year? What happens is we lack the discipline to see it through so that we, like the fox who couldn't reach the grape, said they're probably rotten anyhow, we begin to uh, dismiss resolutions as stupid, which I'm not allowed to say that word around a third grade teacher. <laughs> but they're not. And so today I'm going to challenge us again, starting with me. And we're going to be looking at two chapters in the Old Testament, Joshua 23 and Joshua 24. And this is where the Lord led me. In fact, verses 14 and 15, just throw those up there. Is that you back there, Lee? Joshua, whose uh, his life is ending, gives a charge or a challenge, a charge to the Israelites that he had been leading into the promised land. And he says this, and uh, verse 15, you've seen it on coffee mugs, plaques, people might have it on their door. Here's what he says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods, little g-gods, which, you, which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And verse 15, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then here's the line most Christians know. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That phrase just kept running over my heart, my mind, and, and it was obvious that's what the Lord wanted me to challenge us, you know, because we're going to find out that saying we're going to serve the Lord isn't the whole battle. You actually have to serve the Lord. And so we can all walk out of here today, oh yeah, 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 we're going to serve the Lord. Well, you'll see jo Joshua challenge his people and basically tell him, no, you won't, and we'll see why that is. And then we're going to take it to the New Testament so I can show you that, that the principles that Joshua is speaking about are found in the New Testament in serving the Lord, just as they are found in Joshua 23 and 24. Don't panic. I'm not going to preach every verse of chapter 23 or every verse in chapter 24. I'm going to read a bunch of those chapters, and I won't be making comments on every single verse. But it is important that we understand what led up to Joshua's statement that, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and that the challenge he puts before the people that don't be too quick to say something that you're not going to back up with your life, Okay? And so, let's get started. I'm going to give you three things today to take home with you. The first I'm going to give you is why, and then we're going to have a they slash we should serve the Lord. Why should we serve the Lord? Why? Second, how we should serve the Lord. What does it look like to actually serve the Lord? And then third... I want you to leave here having made a choice when you have all the facts. So let's look at this. We know Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I've made that commitment uh, for me and Trudy in our house. We're going to serve the Lord. So I have been bathing in this in my own life and in my own decisions all this week. And so the first thing that uh, we're going to see here in Joshua, that he gathers the people of Israel together. He knows, 
his time's nigh. He knows that he's getting ready to die. And I've always said when, and I've been by many a bedside of dying people, you don't mince a lot of words talking about stuff that doesn't matter. You, you, so Joshua, who's led the people, is now getting ready to die, and here's what he wants them to focus on as he gets ready to die. So the first thing he's going to talk to them about is why we should serve the Lord, why they, we should serve the Lord. Let's look at Joshua 23, 1 through 5 real quick. Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side. They've entered the promised land now. And Joshua was old, advanced in years. That Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years. And then he says this to them, and you have seen, been witnesses of all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. Isn't that awesome to think that we serve a sovereign God who fights for us? And verse 4, so, excuse me, see, I have appointed to you these nations, which remain as an inheritance for your tribes with all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea toward the setting of the sun. The Lord your God, he will thrust them out from before you and drive them from before you and you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Let's look at verses eight through 10. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you and as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to flight a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. And then we can jump over to Joshua 24, 11 through 13, and see Joshua continuing this theme of the blessings of God and what God has done for them as a people. And he says in verse 11, you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Gadishite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, all them sites. Thus I gave them to your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you have not labored and cities which you had not built and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. What is Joshua doing in this farewell address? He's reminding Israel of God's great blessings. God made them a nation, has sustained them. Even in their rebellion, he sustained them and has brought them into the promised land which he promised that he would do. And now Joshua, getting ready to die, is trying to remind these people, and God, by recording it in Joshua, is reminding us he's a God that blesses those that he loves. Amen? And maybe you're here this morning, and and maybe you got some things going on in your life. You say, well, I don't feel the blessing of the Lord. There might be a multitude of reasons why that might be. But if you're a child of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise you God's working behind the scenes And you might not see it right now, but he has never failed anyone he loves. That's important for us to remember because we're going to get challenged here in a minute by Joshua that says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want every one of us that named the name of Christ to leave here resolute that in 2024, we are going to make decisions in our homes and in our families that we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to see what that looks like here in a second. Well, how does what Joshua told the people of God in the Old Testament relate to us, the people of God, in the New Covenant in the New Testament? I'm glad you asked. Look at Ephesians 2. This is a passage I love. I think Ephesians 2 encapsulates the entire uh, uh, Christian experience of coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I've, I've titled this the testimony of the redeemed. If you are a Christian, you have a testimony. It might not be like mine. It might not be all colorful, but listen, all of us started at the same place. Amen. And then in verse four, we're going to see, but God, amen. amen. 
every one of us who are born again had a but God experience in their life. Let's look. Look at Ephesians 2, 1. Now remember what Joshua is telling the people is how God has blessed them, sustained them, led them, fought for them, and he's telling them all of this because he's getting ready to challenge them to serve God, right? Because Joshua had been in leadership long enough and even under Moses that he knew something about people. You wanna know something about people? We have a propensity to turn our back on God. Even after all his blessings, we make decisions that go against what God wants for us. No amens there, huh? That's not true of any of you. It's true of me. Notice what Paul says to the Ephesian people. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That word dead does not mean physically dead there. It's spiritually dead. Even though physical death is a part of the fall of man, here he's referencing that they are spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Did you know this world has a course? You know, Paul ran, ran the course that God laid before him. The world's running the course that Satan has laid before him. We need to make sure we're on the right course, amen? amen. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Can I lovingly tell you today, every single one of us fits into this verse. Amen. Every one of us. That's who we were. That's who everybody that's been born of woman outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who we all are. Look at verse three. Among them, we too, now Paul's making it personal to his listeners and he's adding himself. I've always told you, when you're witnessing to lost people, you don't talk about you're a sinner. They're, no, 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 we are sinners. We need saved. We need rescued. We're all in the same, but among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now the flesh he's talking about is not this flesh, but the sinful flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature, this is who we are, we're. And by nature, our very nature, children of wrath. What does that mean? It means that when you were born, conceived in the womb of your mother, and you were born and brought into this world, you started out as a child of wrath. If you're here today and you're not born again, you've not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, let me assure you, this is who you are right now. And you might say to yourself, well, you know, I know, but man, I'm as good as that so-called Christian neighbor. That might be true. But the difference between that so-called Christian neighbor and you is that he has been hid under the blood of Jesus. You have not. The Christian neighbor is a sinner who is saved by grace. We're children of wrath, even as the rest. If Paul doesn't finish this line of thinking if we never get to verse four. Do you know what's ahead for us? The wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. But now notice verse four. This is one of my favorite verses of the Bible, but God. Thank God, but God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, God is holy and just and must judge sin, but he's a loving, gracious, merciful God. And so to be just and justifier, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die in our place so he could pour his wrath out on his son at the cross. And the, at the cross, your son, his son, could give us his righteousness, takes our sin. And so God is both just and justifier of all of us, and we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved by faith. Look at verse six, and raised us up with him. Who's him? Jesus. I know I probably shouldn't do that, but him, Jesus, raised us up with him and seated us with him. Who? Jesus in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at verse seven. So that, now why did God do this? 
so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. Remember, where sin doth abound, Romans 5 says, grace does much more abound. Amen? If you're sitting here today saying, I would love to be in Christ, I would love to be saved, but man, you just don't know who I am and what I've done. Let, let me tell you something, friend. I might not, but God does, and he still loves you. Amen. You understand that? His grace is able to cover your sin that in ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Look at verse eight. For by grace are you, you have been saved through faith and it's not of yourselves. Listen to me. When Joshua was writing what he wrote in chapters 23, 24, talking about God delivering them and fighting for them and securing them and backing up his promises, they did not deserve any of that, but God did it anyhow because they were his chosen people. And that's what uh, Joshua is driving at, is that I want you to understand before I die and I leave you, about the goodness of God towards you so that when you make the decision whether or not you're gonna serve him, you will have the knowledge, you'll be reminded of the goodness, the blessings, the grace, the mercy, the love of God on your behalf. That's what Paul's doing. Paul in the New Testament is, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. I had the privilege of seeing my little granddaughter, Mackie McKenzie, and uh, she's something. Uh, we're sitting there and we're opening presents and we, we take our time. We don't like, a, you know, we're not scavengers. And just, you know, one at a time, youngest to oldest. Okay, then it's the oldest to youngest, that kind of stuff. And Mackie's just sitting there with her gift and she's not opening it, which was a real victory for Mackie. And, and she's sitting there and no one is noticing her. Everyone's just talking and, and I happened to just look down at her. She was sitting on the floor and, and she just got overwhelmed. She said, this is the best Christmas ever. <laughs> I mean, what was inside her just came bubbling out and for her it was the gift she was getting, right? Now she was getting gifts and she happened to like getting gifts and I've told you there's nothing wrong with gifts. If you want my address, I'll prove that to you in real time but, but it is more blessed to give than receive and what Paul is telling us who have been saved because of the mercy love and grace of God that it is not of yourself. It is not because you're worthy. It is not because you've done something to deserve the grace of God. It's God being God and loving you where you're at, rescuing you, saving you, and making you his child. Amen. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Look at verse nine. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And what Paul means there is that we can't boast about what we have, about ourselves. Neither could the Israelites. They couldn't boast about, uh, we deserve God to protect us. We deserve God to fight our battles. No, 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 none of us deserve it. It's out of the goodness of God that he does what he does, out of his love, grace, and mercy towards us. And it's not as a result of works, so that no one may boast in themselves. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand from eternity past, by the way, so that we would walk in them. And so we have Paul saying something to the church at Ephesus. We have Joshua saying something to the uh, people of God of the Old Testament. And what they're both saying is God is God and he has blessed because he blesses because he's God and he blesses who he blesses. And that's important for you to understand before we get to the next, ne this next point. God, we should serve the Lord because of his blessings in our life. I didn't want to be a preacher, I can tell you that. You know, I want to be Wolfman Jack on the radio. But... And then even after I was saved, I didn't want to be a preacher because I didn't think I deserved to be one because of my wickedness. It took me a long time to realize that God has nothing but broken people to use, amen? I mean, all of us, we're broken, man. We are sinners saved by grace. And it took me a long time before God said, Jim, I don't have anybody but broken people. Because, but, but Jim, you need us. It's not about you. It's about me and what I'll do through your brokenness. Joshua was telling the people of Israel in the Old Testament, he's reminding them of the goodness of God. And the reason he's doing that is because he's getting ready to challenge them, just like I'm going to here in a minute. And so we see Joshua 
answering the question before they ask it why they should serve the Lord. Now second, notice what that looks like. If I said to you, hey, this year, Sally, I want you to serve the Lord, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does it look like to serve the Lord? Well, let's look at what Joshua uh, tells the people of Israel in verses six or eight of chapter 23. Notice what he says here. And remember, we switch from why to the how, right? We've switched from the why to the how. You know, even kids are like that, right? Why, why do we need to do this? Why, 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 why? Why questions are good, Deshay. Why questions are good? Because, it, because God's word never leaves us hanging. Amen? So let's answer the why of why we should serve, or the how, excuse me, the how. If we look at verses six through eight of ch- chapter 23. Now, verses one through five is Joshua telling about the blessings of God, what he's done for them. Notice what he says in verses six through eight of this 23rd chapter. Here's what he says. You ready? Let me just start in verse five. Lee, jump back to verse five context. The Lord your God, he will thrust them out from before you and drive them from before you, and you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Again, that's what God has done for them. What he's done for you or I is he sent his son to die for us, to be raised from the dead, assuring us that we too will be raised from the dead. But here, notice what, notice what serving God is going to look like. He begins to prepare the people about choosing to serve the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 6. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Now, do you remember how Joshua started in Joshua 1? Lee, I didn't put it down. Could we jump to Joshua 1? And maybe let's just start in verse 3. Remember this, when God, when Moses died, God anointed Joshua to lead the people. And here's what he told Joshua he needed to do to be successful. You ready? Go back to verse 2. I'm sorry, Lee. Okay. Moses, my servant, is dead. Can you imagine the task that would lay before Joshua leading the people? I lead a small group, and sometimes it makes me pull my hair out. Try and lead a nation. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. He's talking to Joshua. Cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, to the sons of Israel. So God is saying, cross over, and I'm going to give you what I promised you. And here's what he says to Joshua. You ready? Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. Look at verse four. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. What a promise. Look at verse six. But you're ready. Now remember, he's talking to who he's raising up to be the leader of us. He says, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Look at verse 7. Only be strong. You know if God says something once, once it's important. If he says it multiple times, pay attention. What does he tell this leader of his people that he needs to be? Strong and courageous. Why? Because it's not just that he's going to fight the enemies. He's going to fight his own people. Be strong and In other words, he's saying, Joshua, I, you need to understand, I'm going to ask you to take stands that are going to be unpopular. And you need to be strong and courageous. Be careful. How is he going to be strong and courageous? Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. My, do all that my servant command. Don't go to the left, don't go right. This book of the law, which we would say now is the Bible, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. By the way, if you're going to serve the Lord this year, there's going to be a whole lot of meditating on the law of the Lord. Amen? Amen? But you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. Listen, if you don't do this in 2024, you will never serve the Lord the way he wants you to serve. You might as well just get that straight. You need to be meditating on the word of God 
so that you can be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Look at verse nine. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. One more verse, verse 10. Joshua 1.10. Then Joshua commanded the officer of the people, and, and so he, get, he starts to lead. And what God said to him is, Joshua, you need to be strong and courageous and you need to do everything my servant Moses commanded you. I don't want you to drift to the left or to the right. Listen, we, listen to me. As human beings, we have a propensity to drift left and right of the word of God. If you're gonna be honest with yourself, Christian, you know that's true. So let's go back to Joshua 23, 6. Be very firm. Remember, he's dying. And he's giving them what he wants them to know after he's gone. So he says in verse 6, be very firm. Where did he get that? Joshua 1. God told him to be very firm. What? Then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, which we now know is this. Joshua is telling the people what God told him when he started to lead. Listen to me, husbands and fathers. You can say that we're going to serve the Lord all you want. But if you don't make a commitment to the word of God in your personal life, you will never serve him the way he wants. You will not know what he wants out of you. So you, if you don't know, you won't follow. And if you don't follow, then it becomes rebellion and sin in your life. I love you enough to tell you that. He says, be very firm then to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand to the left. Do you notice it? Joshua lived his entire life as a leader doing this and now as he's getting ready to die, he's passing it on. Look at verse seven. So that you will not associate with these nations. Remember, we're talking about the how. There are two words that have to be in your life this year if you're gonna do this well. You ready? Obedience and separation. Obedience and separation. Notice what he says in verse seven. Now he's already told him the obedience part in verse six. Be very firm then to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not, excuse me, you may not turn aside from it to, so, to the right hand or to the left. Obedience. Know God's word, obey God's word. So that... What will be true of you if you begin to live your life along that way? So that you will not associate with these nations. What does he mean by that? He says, so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. But you are to cling to the Lord your God. You say, well, pastor, we're under grace. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. That's true. Let's look at John 14, 15 and see if the principle applies to us. Remember the two key words here on the how-to part, you ready, is obedience and separation. Obedience and separation. Let's look at obedience. Jesus says, by the way, he's on his way to the garden when he teaches this to his disciples. If you love me, now you've heard me quote this a zillion times. I quote it a zillion times because it's a significant statement. Jesus says, listen, if you love me, if you really, really, really love me, the proof of that will be that you'll keep my commandments. Now let me ask you something, church. Can you keep what you don't know? So it doesn't start with the obedience. It actually starts with staying in the word so that you can know the commands so that you can. But by the way, there will be churches and pastors that tell you things are commands that aren't commands. They will tell you things that are commands that are not commands. You need to know the difference. What does God's word teach me as a command and what does man teach as a command? And they're not always the same and you might love a pastor and think he's the greatest guy in the world, but you better be like the Bereans, go home daily to search the scriptures to see if these things be so. That includes this preacher. I'm a man. I study hard and I try and be diligent, but it doesn't mean I can't get something wrong. If, if you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. 
Not maybe, not possibly. You will keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This is the third time we've heard him say this in one little passage of scripture. If you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey me. If you obey me, that's proof that you love me. In other words, it's not lip service, it's feet service. I can tell Trudy I love her all day long. But if my actions don't back up that statement, how long do you think it's going to be before Trudy starts to get disgusted with that statement? Or she's going to roll her eyes and say, yeah, whatever. Because love is only known by the action it promotes. Love is only known by the action it promotes. Jesus is saying the love he's talking about, the action that it promotes is what? That we obey him, that we follow him and obey him. Jesus answered, said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So we get a pretty clear picture here that Jesus is saying obedience is a pretty significant trait of a true follower of Jesus. Joshua challenged his people not to drift. Jesus is challenging his disciples. He's getting ready to go to the cross. They don't know it. He's on his way to the garden. He's going to get arrested. He's going to be crucified. They don't know that's going to happen yet. And yet Jesus is telling them right now, listen, if you are going to follow me, it's going to be out of love. I want you to obey out of love, not out of fear, not out of condemnation. I want you to do it because you love me. And that will only happen. <laughs> that will only happen if you understand how much I love you right? That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, right? 14, 15. Look at that, Lee. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. Just write down the references of nothing else or go home, watch the video so you can dissect it more. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, 15. And you know this, for the love of Christ controls us. Now, I told you a million times, let me say it one more time, that when I read this, when I was first saved, I thought it was his love for Jesus that controlled him. Because when you're first saved, you still don't get that it's not you, it's him, right? You still want to make it about you and what you're doing. Paul understood what we grow to understand for the love of Christ, not the love for Christ, the love of Christ controls us. In other words, what Paul is saying is, listen, when I met Jesus on the Damascus road and I got understanding of what Jesus did for me, it changed me. It literally changed me. And once I was in relationship with the Son of God, I spent the rest of my life declaring him, serving him, loving him, following him. Why? Because he never got over the love Jesus had for him. It controlled him, having concluded this. Now, how did it conclude? How did this do it, Paul? Having concluded this, bottom line, that one died for all and therefore all died. Who's the one that died for all? Jesus. Look at verse 15. And he, Christ, died for all so that they who live, physically live, spiritually live, for, those, for they who live might no longer live for themselves. That is the hardest truth to happen in your life, isn't it really? I mean, honestly, if we're going to be real with each other, how often do you think about this? How often are, are you taking the wheel back of your life and, and directing your life the way you want it to go, right? Who I date, who I marry, what I do, what I this, what I that, what I do. Paul says that if we grasp the love that Jesus has for us, that we would, like Paul, no longer live for ourselves, but for him, Christ, who died and rose again on their behalf. So we got the obedience part down. What about the separation part? Is that a New Testament truth? 
I'm glad you asked. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 21. Uh, and and, and, and into chapter 7, verse 1. Again, this is New Testament teaching, New Testament principles. Paul's telling the Corinthians something. It, and, and the Holy Spirit's saying to us, remember, there were two words that were important in Joshua's teachings that we're finding out are true in New Testament teachings, which is what? Obedience and separation. Obedience and separation. Remember what Joshua said before we even look at it. Remember what he said? He said, verse seven, so that you will not associate with these. No, 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 no. Let me say this real quick. How can we win people that we don't associate with? What he's saying is to associate them in a, such a way is that you begin to adopt their thinking and their practices, not God's. When we should be leading the blind to Jesus, too often times, people in the church are being led by the, by the blind away from Jesus. Here's what Paul says. Go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Do not, bound, do not be bound together with unbelievers. Same thing Joshua said. Same thing. Right? Same thing. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness or what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. What, stop right there. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? I'm sorry, who said that? Yeah. Yeah, hey, teenager, young adult dating. And I ask you, does your boyfriend, girlfriend love Jesus? And you give me the, oh, I don't know. Yes, you do know. You're just lying to yourself because you want the relationship. You're violating what is being taught here. Well, I'll marry him and I'll get him to change. Do you know how many women have cried in my office over 30 years because it didn't come the way they thought it would? Because they violated the separation. The separation. Listen to me, if all your friends are lost, there's good. I love you. If all your best friends are lost, you are not serving Christ. If you tell me you're more comfortable with lost people than you are saved people, you're not following Christ. You're not. You have a Christian who's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, some are and some aren't. We got to quit using that as a blanket statement. Some Christians are hypocrites because they say one thing and do another. That's being a hypocrite. But there's another side to that. We are ever evolving into Christ likeness, which means we are still going to make mistakes. Yes, even sin. It doesn't mean we're a hypocrite. It means that we're evolving and growing and learning how to love and follow Jesus. And so he says, or what harmony, what together has Christ of Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Look at verse 16. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Look at verse 17. Therefore, because that's true, come out from their midst and, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Look at verse 18. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, because all of that is offered and given to us by God. Having these glorious, precious promises. I didn't have a dad. I mean, I had a biological guy that got my mom, but I didn't have a dad. The only dad I've ever known is God. Amen, I have a father. What a dad to have. Amen. I'll put my dad up against Bill Gates' child any day of the week. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I mean, God says, Come out, be separate. I'm your father, you're my children. Uh, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's New Testament. That's grace. That's under New Testament grace. We're being taught to what? Come out and be separate. John 14, what are we being taught? Obedience is proof we love him. Obedience and separation are a part of following Jesus. And all of us need to go home and examine what that looks like in our lives. 
have the courage to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, in what ways am I being attached to this world? In what ways am I not living the separated life under Christ? In what ways am I not obeying the commands of Christ? Because it's not enough to say you love him if you're not obeying him. And yes, that's in an ever-increasing way. And by the way, we don't obey him to be saved. We obey because we are saved. Don't go home and try to work all this out so you can be approved. No, no, no. I'm approved by God because of what Jesus did at the cross. And because I am, out of hearts of gratitude, I love and serve him. Which is what we're trying to say here. Obedience and separation. If you're obedient, you'll be separate. But if you're not separate, you're not obedient. Now, let me make clear here. I am not saying you don't engage a lost world. I'm not saying you don't let lost people come and eat in your home. In fact, you should. You should welcome them. You should love on them. You should serve Christ by serving them. That's how we show them the gospel. That's how we put feet and and, and, and hands to the gospel. We're going to love these people to Christ. So we got to engage them. Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, make the most out of every opportunity with outsiders. Make the most. So whether it's at work, a neighborhood, a, a friend. And by the way, after you're saved and you might have friends that are lost, don't cut them off. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying love them to Christ. But if you used to practice sinful activities with those friends, you cut the sinful activities off. And when they say, why won't you no longer do this with us? Then you got to take a stand. You got to be firm. You got to be strong and courageous, knowing that when you tell them it's because I'm now a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, they might cut you off. But I'll tell you this, it's better that they cut you off than God does. We have to risk friendships. We have to risk them. And some will cut you off. They will. They cut Jesus off and they'll cut us off. Family will cut you off. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 10. I'm I'm still good. Matthew 10. When Jesus... When Jesus, thank you, brother. When Jesus says this, and he says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents. This is uh, Matthew 10, 16 and on. The midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Be shrewd as serpents, but innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, which the synagogue in the New Testament was what? The church. Uh, 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 Jews, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say, for it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. And then listen to this, you ready? A brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, for it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Listen to me. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's saying. And he goes down into... Verse 34 of the same chapter, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. But a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother. That sounds like Jesus is a homewrecker. But here's the truth. Someone that's going to love and separate is going to be at odds with those who are of the world. It might be your parents, it might be your children, it might be your aunt and uncle, it might be your best friend from childhood. Verse 36, he says, and a man's enemies will be of the members of his own household. And he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. You think they're serious about obedience and separation? And it's risky. 
Like some of you right now are thinking, I've got some friends. I love hanging out with them. And they're lost as lost can be. They tell the coarse jokes. They do the things. We go to bars. I don't get drunk like I used to, but... You know what I've never found true is I've ever led someone to Christ while they're getting pounded in alcohol. Though I've tried. The call is to serve. The how is to be obedient and separate. And so what now? What do we do now? And it's not just separate from people. It's separate from a world system, right? I mean, more and more denominational pastors are succumbing to the world's ways. I mean, just recently, the Pope, and I'm not knocking Catholics, but the Pope has now come out and said that, hey, priest, go ahead and bless same-sex relationships. I mean, after all, if they love each other, isn't that what counts? There's a world system in place that opposes God. And we have to be able to take stands against it. Right? It's a woman's choice. No, no, no. The woman's choice is to have sex or not. Once she's impregnated and there is a fetus in that womb, that is... God's design, a baby is there, and you, have, you should not have the choice to kill that baby. Listen, quit having sex if you don't want babies. Amen. And no trans man, no, hold on, trans woman, I don't know which, a man can't have babies. Amen. And they've changed the language. Now it's birthing people. What? 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 But it doesn't break my heart that the world is drowning in a cesspool. What breaks my heart is when I hear people who profess to follow Jesus acquiescing to this. And they can only do that if they're not in the Word of God. Because if you're in the Word of God, you know he made a male and female. It, it, it is plain and simple. But the world has taken out all of the biblical thinking and rationalizing all that they're doing. And the only way we're going to know what's right and wrong is in this book as the Holy Spirit is our resonant guide and teacher and the truth of Christ. And you will, you will fall prey to their insidious plans if you don't stand firm on God's word. And by the way, I don't need to be hateful. If a same-sex couple came to me and said, will you marry us? No. And then I would take them in the Word and show them why I won't. Because it's not biblical. Doesn't mean I don't love them. Doesn't mean I'm not going to share Jesus with them. Of course I am. I'm not to be a hater. I'm not setting myself a self-righteous condemnation. I... They're lost. They're blind. They don't know what they don't know. And so God has raised us up into their life, Sally, so that we could show them by both word and action. That's why Paul says in Colossians 4, make the most of every opportunity with outsiders. The word outsiders there is, is just another term for the lost. So now we get to this place. What's our, what's our choice? Well, Joshua in chapter 24 and verse 15, you know what his choice was. He says in verse 15, if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, after he's already told them all that God's done for them, <laughs> who, who's choosing to oppose God? In fact, if you, and I don't have time, I'll just read it real quick. In verse 10 of chapter 23, one of your men puts the flight a thousand for the Lord your God is he who fights for you. Yeah, I want to be on that dude's side. Amen? One man takes, puts the flight a thousand. Yeah, I want to serve that God. And, and so Joshua said, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. By the way, can I love you and tell you, you really are ultimately either choosing God or Satan. There ain't a third choice, friends. I'm not choosing. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're either running the course that God's laid out for you or you're running the course of the, of the spirit of this world that's laid out. 
if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so the people right away said this. Look at verse 16. The people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us, uh, uh, us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. They're saying, look, we get it, Joshua. Of course we're gonna serve God. Look what he's done for us. Then the, then the Lord drove them out, uh, from, uh, excuse me, then the, the, the Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord for we are with, and you know, it's there saying, Joshua, we're with you, man. We're with you, Joshua. Notice what Joshua says to them in verse 19. Then Joshua said to the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he's done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, no, no, we, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. And now therefore, verse 23, now therefore put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord the God of Israel. And in verse 24, the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we'll obey his voice. And you know what Joshua was telling them? That, you, that some of them had intermingled with the world. But they were all in unison. Yeah, hey, we're gonna serve God. Yeah, we're gonna do it. And you're gonna leave here today. Yeah, preacher, we're gonna serve God. And then what Joshua told them might be true of some of you. No, no, no. If you're gonna really serve God, there's some things you gotta cut out of your life. There's some practices, right? Amen. Friendships. Because saying you're going to serve the God, serve God, means nothing if it's not followed up with actually serving the Lord through obedience and separation. Now, if you're here today and you're lost, you're sitting there saying, man, this is the harshest sermon I've ever heard. And, and I get it. I do. I get it. Because before I saved, I'd be saying the same thing you are. It looks different once you're in relationship with Christ. Amen. Once, you, once you have yielded your life to the Lord Jesus at the foot of the cross. When you realize that we are wicked, we are sinners, and none of us are righteous, and we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we deserve the wrath of God, and yet Jesus came to this earth. We just celebrated his first coming, and he came to this earth in order that we might have a way out of our sin problem because we couldn't fix ourselves. And so Jesus came and he lived a sinless life so he could die a sacrificial death and be raised the third day uh, by the power of God. And, and if we will place our faith in the person of Christ, our trust, our hope, our faith in Christ and his work on the cross on our behalf and his resurrection on the third day, we will be called the children of God. And once you're a child of God and you realize your own wickedness before Christ, You'll begin to see the world differently than you did before. You'll begin to see that the world is opposing God. You'll be seeing that the world's ways are not God's ways. And you're going to have to make choices. Right? I mean, I made choices when I married Trudy. That meant I'm, I'm Trudy's now. I, I, I'm Trudy's. Right? We took vows. Whether you know it or not, you, you vowed to God to love him, serve him because of what he's done for you. And now what I'm offering you in 2024 is this opportunity to serve the Lord. To start this year out. Listen, resolutions are good things. They are. It is us taking stock of who we are and what we are. And if we weigh too much, then we're going to be thinking about how we can lose weight. If we have uh, bad habits in our life that harm our bodies and set poor examples for our children, yeah, we need to take a look at those. 
if we cuss like a sailor, and then we find out in Ephesians 4, that let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which edifies the hearer. Yeah, we're probably going to have to cut that stuff out too. None of that is to be saved. No, no, no. We do it because we are saved. You need to make that distinction. Don't go out of here and try to live what I've just taught so you can be approved by God. You're approved by God because of what God did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've placed your faith in Christ. What I'm talking about is we already are the people of God. And I want us to make a conscious choice as individuals to go home to our homes and say this, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I know now, if I didn't know before, obedience and separation. Obedience and separation. I need to be meditating on the Word of God day and night. That doesn't mean you always have a Bible open in your home, but put it in there in the morning so you can chew on it. I didn't write out a full manuscript, but I've been chewing on this for two weeks. I put the Word into my heart, and I, I just, I got a little outline thing, but the Word was deep in my heart. Half the scriptures I gave you today weren't even in my notes. But that's because I bury it deep in my heart so that now the Holy Spirit can bring it up when it's needed. He'll do that for you. If you're a new Christian, 1 Peter 2, 2, desire you the sincere mark of the word that you may grow thereby. As a newborn babe, desire you the sincere mark of the word that you may grow thereby. But we can't stay on milk. Hebrews 5 tells us that strong meat belonging to them that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. That's why young Christians can still be sucked into the world system because they're just not old enough. They're not developed enough. That's where we come in as older brothers and sisters and we help them to understand what God's word says. Amen. And I love that every day of my life I can grow. I in no way means knows everything about the Bible. Sometimes I, la I laugh to myself when you all say, hey, man, what does this mean? And I got to come back and say, I don't know. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, to look through a glass dimly, and we know in part, one day we'll know as we're known. Ah, thank you, brother. We just, we just keep growing. Keep loving, keep serving, keep obeying. Like, I want each one of you to have the privilege of leading one person to Christ before you die. I just want every one of you that is truly a Christian to have that privilege of sitting across from someone with the Bible open and seeing tears on their face when they come to Jesus Christ. But I can't make that happen. That's a you and the Lord. If you obey, you'll separate. If you separate, it's because you've obeyed. I love you. I hope you have a prosperous 2024. I hope God uses you in mighty ways for his kingdom. Amen. Live for Jesus, and I promise you, he'll fight your battles. Amen. I love you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I love you so much. I'm thankful that you love me in spite of my imperfections, my flaws, the times I rebel against your teaching, uh, just in simple ways. Father, I'm glad that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. I'm so thankful that if we've been washed, we just need our feet washed. I'm thankful today, God, that you can use broken people to declare your glory. Father, help us at AFM to be that little spiritual engine that could, to do that which you've called us to do as we humble ourselves, take the yoke of your son upon us in our life and allow you to lead us rather than the other way around. Father, I pray that you'll take the sickness out of our community and that families will be healed physically so that they can grow spiritually by coming to church. We love you and we pray this in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ and amen.